And welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for being with us here on this program today. Uh, we are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. By the way, that Wednesday morning broadcast, that's our special edition of Tell Me Your Story, and I hope you will join us for all four broadcasts. You know, if you can't, we also have podcasts, and they are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, many other locations throughout the Internet where you can listen to Tell Me Your Story uh, as well as on YouTube. That's right. You can watch these interviews on YouTube. The channel, Tell Me Your Story, look for the guy with the black hat or the dirty black hat or whatever i'm here on youtube uh please go there subscribe to the podcasts as well as to the video cast so that every time i upload a new program you will be notified and be able to listen to our special guests as they share with us their insights into the work that they do into how we can make this a better world for everyone we also encourage you, if uh, you are able to do so, to support us financially. If what we're doing resonates with you, if you like our guests and the conversation that we're having, and you're following through by going to their website, we certainly hope that if you can support us, that's the reason why we have a PayPal and Patreon account. It's for your security as well as ours. Just put in when you want to send us a, a, a contribution. Richard at RichardDugan.com. That's the email address, Richard at RichardDugan.com, so that uh, if you'd like to support us, you can. And then also participate with all of us in the Decade of Perfect Vision, where we encourage you to go within, spend time listening to that still, small voice, and finding that calm, quiet, peaceful place to relax, rejuvenate, uh, get inspired, get encouraged. And, uh, and, and just spend that time with yourself. Get to know who you really are, the real you inside. Today we're going to get to know the real you, or actually in this case, the real him. Our guest today is uh, going to be joining us and talking about an organization that I found out about and I was utterly intrigued, actually uh, so curious that I said, I've got to get this, I've got to find out more about this. Reverend Paul Nugent, no relation, I don't believe, to the <clears throat> American Nugent. We're going to talk about the Aetherius Society, I hope I have that pronounced correctly, and uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend to Reverend, welcome to Tell Me Your Story. Well, thank you very much, Richard, and it's a, it's a great honor to be on your show um you're you're right i don't have any known um connection to the american nugent aka ted but we're a we're a small clan the nugent so at some point i'm sure we did hook up back in the day uh the one the one thing as far as i'm concerned is that uh, those people who are able to watch the youtube video the video cast uh will know that uh the nugent here in america of course uh is probably always packing well, so am I. Behind me, I've got two cannons. Now, they are pointed in the opposite direction, <clears throat> uh, but that is for very specific reasons, which uh, we'll go into maybe later. I want to ask you about the, um, obviously, about the uh, society, which, uh, again, I was so intrigued by. The Aetherius, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the Aetherius Society. Yeah, that's correct. And the slogan... First of all, I'm intrigued by the little logo to the left of the uh, of the title there, cooperating with the gods from space. Um, yes, I want you to tell us about the Aetherius Society, but what do you mean you're in cooperation with the gods, plural? And by the way, it is a, a capital G here, of space. Yeah, that's um, that's it. A very um, well profound question. It's an imp to me. Um, we were talking earlier about you know the situation in Afghanistan. To me, there are so many um, almost overwhelming challenges that we that we're facing in the world in our world at this time. And I, it's not a matter of there being no easy solutions. I'm not even sure there are solutions. Uh, what we need is a complete reorientation of thought. 
in, 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 in my own understanding. We need, we need a whole new vision as to what we're doing on this planet, how we got here, what our purpose is, where we go from here, if we go anywhere from here, uh, is death ultimate, all these kinds of questions. And the Ethereum Society, uh, which was founded in England in 1955, answers those questions. We do recognize that there are beings, intelligences, advanced life living on other dimensions of existence, both upon this Earth, but also beyond this planet, uh, within our own solar system, and indeed throughout the entire galactic system, which is, which is infinite, or is, is infinite, I was going to say it's vast, it, it, it's infinite in scope. Uh, we are not alone. And yet we, our culture has grown up believing that we're alone. We've become incestuous. We've created all kinds of, of, of uh, as I say, almost overwhelming challenges. And what is needed more than anything is a whole new uh, vision and understanding, not any fake belief but something that is tangibly real and provable. And to that extent, that's where our term gods from space, we refer to that as being uh, more advanced uh, uh, spiritually, technologically intelligences than ourselves living, with, as I say, within the solace, within, within all of creation. Mm. Well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, let me say that um, from my perspective, uh, as a, a, a being living on this planet and having done so for uh, a scant 61 years, only been here that long, um, I think it's the height of arrogance of human humans, the human race, to think that we're the only, and someone made the interesting distinction here, some people say the only intelligent beings, but this person said the only beings in the universe uh because apparently this person was taking umbrage uh with us classifying ourselves as intelligent hmm. and i think that's a fair distinction to be made mm. because of the way that we treat ourselves and others of the same let alone of other species but i think that it is the height of arrogance to think that we are the only ones out here um, I know that our philosophies, I like to call, refer to, to them as that, such as Christianity, Judaism, uh, Muslim, the Muslim faith, uh, Zen Buddhism, uh, and those are the major ones. But then you start branching off into all of the others, and there are, I don't know how many, hundreds, if not thousands. Um, I would think that maybe a better way to put it is, there are as many philosophies on this planet as there are human beings. Yeah, because no people, or people or, think with, alike. Yeah, with nuance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now the uh, the society, as you say, uh, that was founded um, by a Dr. George King. Tell us about him. Yeah, indeed, he was he was English uh, like myself. He was born in in a county called Shropshire, which is called sort of in the in the middle of the country, uh, in 1919, coming right out of the out of the Second World uh, out of the First World War. A uh, very sort of impoverished, difficult time. He um, had a difficult childhood. Grew up, um, well, actually, in another county, mainly called Yorkshire, and then um, uh, mainly in sort of farming country and things like that. And then, twenty years later, of course, around came another world war, the Second World War, uh, and he, having grown up um, in a in a what I would probably term a very sort of Christian household or a traditional Christian, a spiritual household, let's put it like that. Um, he knew that it was, that, that thou shalt not kill was not just sort of an idea. It was, it was a truth. It was, it was literally a commandment. And he honored it deep within his conscience. So as such, he was at the outset of, of the Second World War, a conscientious objector. That having been said, he was no, by far from being a fool. Um, but he could see that, you know, uh, the, the rise of Nazism and the invasion of England or Britain uh, was something to be um, repelled. And so he joined the, uh, in, 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 as such, he wanted to help, just not in a, in, in a combative way. And so he joined uh, the London Fire Brigade um, 
as a section leader, which was an incredibly brave thing to do in itself, because as, you, as you'll know, um, the, the, the invasion of Britain very soon turned to dropping of bombs on London, was known as the Blitz. And here he was having to uh, go into um, burning houses, uh, houses that were crumbling from, from bombing to rescue people. His own life was very much in danger, it took tremendous amount, tr tremendous amount of courage to do that. But at the same time, he could, you know, it, it caused him to question why, 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 why are humans doing this to humans? Why am I, um, what, why are innocent civilians being, being killed in this way, in this madness of war? And having grown up, as I say, in a very spiritual household, uh, his mother, it was someone extremely psychic. He had been very psychic. He knew that there were sort of other uh, levels of frequency or of existence, um, that there was far more to life than was commonly understood. And so coming out of that very uh, traumatic experience, uh, he began to study and practice the ancient science of yoga, which was, I mean, I know it's all the rage has been here for, for several decades, but back in England in the 1940s, it certainly wasn't. Uh, and we're not just talking about, you know, postures and stretching. We're talking about um, the real, well, I suppose, because the, the sort of more serious aspects of yoga. Yoga being a Sanskrit word, which means union, essentially union with, with, with that, union with God. Uh, it's a state of, um, of consciousness known by the Sanskrit word of samadhi. So he, he began practicing various forms of yoga, primarily pranayama, which is yoga breathing. Uh, also uh, mantra yoga and he did this with an incredible intensity for up to eight hours a day over a 10-year period and so when you are practicing yoga with that uh, literally kind of, uh, of seriousness and intensity it's going to bring about a change what it's actually going to do is it's going to bring about a, a rise of, of a force that we all have in the base of the spine called the kundalini, another Sanskrit word. And it's gonna force that kundalini to rise through a channel in the spine known as the sushumna channel and open the psychic centers, or again, to use a Sanskrit word, the chakras uh, that we all have in, in, our, in our aura, in our body. And it in it, he eventually attained um, as I mentioned, the, the sort of goal of yoga, or the, the ability to go into this state of samadhi, mm -hmm. uh, co what we know it more in the West as cosmic consciousness. This experience in which one knows that it's all absolute oneness, and one has access to all knowledge. It's a, it's a state of complete and utter bliss. It's the state, actually, we believe in the Ethereum society, that we're all, that's the, the purpose that we're here on earth, to attain that state of consciousness. That is why we're here. And indeed, beyond that state um, of, of so-called enlightenment, it goes on um, to the experience of ascension. You know, people talk about the ascension. Well, the, the way to do it is to be able to attain cosmic consciousness at will. Then one has no longer any purpose or need well, I won't say purpose, but need certainly uh, to be here on earth. That's where the gods from space comes in. One goes on to other levels of experience um, within the vastness of creation, uh, albeit on a, on a much higher level of, of, of frequency and realization. Mm. So Dr. George King, just coming, um, he, he was able um, by the sort of, certainly early to mid 1950s, able to go into that state of consciousness. And in, in, in May of 1954, uh, he was first contacted by a being from another world um, who goes by the pseudonym of Aetherius, we believe um, who comes from the planet Venus. And hence we are the Aetherius Society. The Aetherius Society was formed following that contact. And over the next, certainly 25 years, uh, Dr. George King retained the ability to go into what we call this state of, 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 of samadhi or cosmic consciousness and receive 
verbally transmissions or they were communicated through him uh, transmissions from these beings from other worlds from other dimensions of the other planets in our solar system so that's a um, little a little bit about george king and the founding of the ethereal society we are talking with reverend paul nugent he is the director of the <clears throat> america and now are you here in the united states or are you in the uk today yeah, I am in the United States. I've been here for 31 years. I am a director, just to be very clear. We have several, uh, I am an international director. We have eight international directors. All in right. Place. And of course, the uh, American headquarters, or at least the the direct, uh, the, the facility is in Hollywood, California, uh, as far as what we're referring to today. And we're talking about the Ethereum Society. Here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. As we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true, we're looking for those new ways of living. And I think our guest, Reverend Paul Nugent, is uh, going to help us to do that through uh, exploring the Ethereum Society. That's right. We're going to explore, find out what it's all about. Uh, we're going to find out a little bit more about enlightenment, service, God, and the meaning of life, UFOs and extraterrestrial messages prayer energy, the Mother Earth and our future, karma and reincarnation, intuition and psychic powers and spiritual healing, just to name a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I want to thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, this time and uh, sharing with us about the Ethereum Society. Uh, it is fascinating. Everything that you mentioned uh, to, uh, to this point I am familiar with, of course, as probably many people are, uh, having read hundreds of times, I've read this book, it is my metaphysical primer, Autobiography of a Yogi. I first listened to it uh, through Talking Books for the Blind when I was in my teens, which was a good 40 plus years ago, and um, uh, I have it on my phone, the original recordings from those talking books. I know that Ben Kingsley's recorded it, I know a bunch of other people have recorded it, I remember many of the stories and the one story that came to my mind when you talked about uh, cosmic consciousness or samadhi uh this one story from that particular book uh that i thought was really interesting was when uh he was given he went to the movies uh and actually i think it may have actually been uh with his uh with his guru Sri teshwar and uh, they didn't care much for that, as they refer to it, Cinescope. So they're outside the theater, and he gives them a thump on the chest, and all of a sudden, Paramahansa is aware of everything around him, 360 degrees, just total, utter, and complete awareness. Mm -hmm. And when I think about this aspect of cosmic consciousness, or samadhi, or again, as you referred to the kundalini energy in the spine and, and sitting in a particular, not necessarily sitting in a particular position, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. getting the alignment to where you have that energy flow. Right. And you become one with all. A matter of fact, I believe if I was, I was just actually reading a quote, and if I can get to it uh, here real quickly here from uh, Dr. Dr. George King, uh, the quote is, when you really study the nature of all things, you can see that all life is one. Yeah. And it's one of those aspects I'd like for us to maybe dive into in this particular segment. But I want to tie it into a specific area of those nine that I referenced just a moment ago. The one I'd like to, to jump into is intuition and psychic powers now you heard me mention about the uh, the aspect of uh, the decade of perfect vision the 2020s where we encourage people to go within and listen to that still small voice follow their intuition talk to us about your experiences learning the techniques that yes dr uh, george king has shared through the work of the Ethereum society but also through other masters and teachers down through the centuries and how you perceive the world, how you perceive, well, perceive me, perceive where you are right now physically uh, and so forth in light of not just the teachings, but even your own experiences of trying to or working towards. And I don't know if, have you achieved Samadhi? No, no, I haven't. 
uh, at all. Um, I mean, how, 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 in answer to, to your to your question, which is you know obviously a very um, broad question, um, and how I perceive, I, you see, I, psychic powers are not the gift of of, of, of any single individual. Uh, they're latent within every single one of us. Uh, but it's just that um, we have. Um, put layers upon our own mind by the way we've um, talked to ourselves, uh, by con the conditioning of society. Um, we've quelled them. Um, we, we've, we've made them go virtually uh, inert, if that's the right word. Uh, and it's only when we sort of awaken to some intuitive sense within ourselves, which is essential to, because again, uh, you know, what, what we also have buried within us, believe it or not, is, is, is this wonderful thing called conscience. And when we, can, when we activate our conscience, whatever it is that may trigger us to do that, which, which to me, that's the sort of, that's the entry point, one's own, one's own conscience. When one goes into that because it speaks, up, it, knows, it knows truth. It knows truth. It does not lie. Uh, and by going into that, then one sort of begins to open up. What comes out of it uh, is a love and a realization, uh, which leads one to, to which which opens up one's mind and, and and one's heart into the realization that yes, it is all one. That that there is nothing that actually is separate from anything else. Which uh, I won't say gives one realization. It doesn't, but it certainly gives one compassion. Mm -hmm. and understanding yeah. and so i think that you know that is at least that i would say my view my own viewpoint um uh how how I, i've got one 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 more year actually almost two more years on you richard because I've, i'm 62 coming up to 63 mm -hmm. but um you know we seem to be coming from a fairly similar space after our six decades mm -hmm. um uh, that yeah, we're here to, it is all oneness. We're here to cooperate. We're here to share. It is not about greed. It is not about selfishness. Uh, it is totally uh, uh, about cooperation, um, oneness, on this incredible quest and journey towards uh, realization or enlightenment. Mm. And one certainly does sort of pick up psychic abilities along the way. It's certainly intu uh, intuition, which is probably the one of the main um, psychic abilities. Reverend Paul Nugent is my guest here on the program. We're talking about the Aetherius Society, and uh, it's uh, located in, as far as the states are concerned, it's located here in the in Hollywood, California, and is at least one location. And we certainly hope that you will go to the Aetherius Society. We will be linked, of course, uh, uh, Reverend, to your website, to the website, which we encourage people uh, to go to, which of course is aetherius.org. And that's A-E-T-H-E-R-I-U-S dot org. As we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And what we're trying to do now is trying to figure out where we're going next. What is, what is going to happen in the coming days, weeks, months, years? Uh, I find it very interesting how uh, people have been talking, and then this, is, of course, is in light of the pandemic, which none of us has been through before. Uh, very few left on the planet who went through the first one in the uh, late uh, 19 uh, teens, uh, 19, what was it, 1918, I guess it was, 1919, with the Spanish flu. Uh, and uh, I, have to, I have to give our species a little credit here. Because for the first time in my lifetime, we did something different. Whereas in the 60 years that I have been here, <clears throat> 61 years, every time there is the flu, the influenza that starts to circle the earth, we don't do nothing. We came up with a vaccine. We came up with, you know, a shot, a flu shot. But we don't change our behavior. This time we did. And I couldn't I could not be more excited for that. Now, I realize a lot of people were hurt by it economically and so forth. But here's the reason why I was excited by it, because Einstein says 
Insanity, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And that's what we were doing. But this time we decided to do something different. And I tell you, uh, Reverend, I have been telling people we need to shut down the airlines and travel for two weeks. When the influenza hits the states, shut it down for two weeks. <gasps> Richard, are you kidding me? It will devastate our economy. Having gone through the pandemic, really? I don't think so. And then, of course, I start talking about the economic uh, impact if we don't. I mean, imagine the loss of productivity. I mean, if, if the economy is the most important thing, which I don't agree that it is, but if it were the most important thing, don't you think that you'd want your workers, and I use the term loosely, to be at optimum health and well-being to provide the best productivity, to create the best products, the best quality for the consumer, of which they are one? Uh, whereas if you've got the flu, if you're not feeling well, and yet you're still going to work and producing, where's your productivity rate? All right, and now that's assuming that that's our core. So when we do something different, uh, uh, Reverend, um, it's exciting because I thought, wow, there are opportunities out there we don't even know exist yet. And there were. And there are people who have actually thrived during this period. Yes, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have lost their lives. But here's what I wanted to talk to you about in this regard. I think that one of the main reasons why we lost, we have lost so many people, and we're still losing them, because now we've got these variants, has more to do with the fact that we haven't taken care of ourselves over the decades, in a, in a, in a, health-wise, because our lifestyles are, are killing us. Look, I mean, look at some of the, look at a lot of the foods that we eat. The, the beverages, the liquids that we drink, the things that we do to our bodies. Um, your thoughts in that regard to turning not just the pandemic, but turning our population, our species around, uh, because it seems to me like uh, we may not have to worry about global warming or any of this other stuff from an external level we're killing ourselves from within and we don't need to be doing that your thoughts well richard these are my own personal thoughts obviously i'm not speaking on behalf of the whole ethereum society in this regard but um i certainly uh agree with you to to a very large extent so, and you know first and foremost <clears throat> in that the economy <clears throat> we've made it the most important thing it shouldn't be the most important thing um life uh if when one looks at the natural world the natural world uh does not do a a, a, a monetary exchange and there's there's no profit and greed in that exchange humans have sort of created that uh, and we've we've made a monster out of it uh i think also when one i mean another very personal thought on that this is that yes obviously it's tragic to lose one's life but i think that we've got the whole concept of, of death very misconstrued. Uh, in reality, there is no such thing as death. And we've mixed it up at the same time, a very human trait, and it's a good one in, 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 in most ways, I would have to say, but we, we're very sentimental. Uh, nature is not sentimental. And so, oh, loved ones and all the rest of it, we get very clingy and fearful and all the rest of it. Uh, all as a consequence, really, of, of our unenlightened understanding of, of this incredible mystery of life, in which, as I say, there is actually no such thing as death. Uh, there is no separation, in point of fact. Um, I would have to agree that we are a very, very sick society. Uh, and obviously, those most at risk from, from, from COVID-19 are those who have preconditions from from other diseases that, um, as you say, wrong kind of diet, lack of exercise, all, all of that has, has you know, fed into, one might say. Uh, so it is, it, um, it, it is complicated. I would also say that actually the biggest plague on the planet is, is mankind. We, we are the disease. 
uh, the, the planet is, you know, climate change and everything else, but it's humanity that has, has, you know, nature, when it gets, when there's too much of something, it has a cull, it has a clean out. It, it's just, an, you know, if there's too much forest in the, far, it, 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 you know, wood in the, in the forest or whatever else, there will, a fire will, will create, will cleanse itself. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sort of a natural process. Now, I'm not advocating for that, but I think that, you know, um, by making the economy the most important thing, by being fearful and, and all the rest of it, um, which buys into the sort of stress levels uh, and the, the risks of, or the, the, you know, the weakening of one's own natural immune system. It is a very complicated thing. That having said, these are my own, pers my own personal take Sure. on all of that but you did say earlier on what about the days you know weeks months years to come i just like to sort of respond to that if i may Ew. yes because you know as you will know a few months ago but sort of uh, the, the 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 pentagon the sort of bastion of the american establishment was one might say forced to reveal its uh, classified documents on what they call uaps unidentified aerial phenomena some of which uh, cannot be explained, some of which to any reasonable thinking human being clearly um, is not any apparition or anything. It, it's something that's got incredible intelligence behind it, incredible technology behind it, and is certainly something not being made by human beings. Uh, at the same time, in, in Britain, uh, it, you know, in the last, uh, this past, month or so from what i understand but there's been uh, a, a lot of of new crop circles uh, and anybody who's researched crop circles will know okay yeah some of them are you know trampled the ground with with guys with pieces of wood or whatever else but certainly the the the, 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 the great ones the vast ones to just the incredible ones that show up overnight are not being made by human beings and i think that these so-called uaps i think things like crop circles again as i say beginning to sort of show up in, in large and incredible numbers um are ways in which hu humanity is slowly be or being awakened to some greater reality because we do need as i was saying at the beginning a whole new vision a whole new understanding something to turn us around something to fill us with awe something to fill us with wonder and it invokes a love it in it, it we, we we just become filled with this just incredibly uplifting energy and vibration something exciting where's the excitement in our world there's virtually no excitement it's dry it's dull it's miserable it's it's drudgery it's hard to get through it's why we have so much suicide and drug abuse because we've lost that fundamental sense of what we're a part of and that sort of really brings us right back to the whole essential message uh, that these beings the gods from space were delivering through dr george king we're talking with reverend paul nugent of the Aetherius society i'm richard dugan this is tell me your story new paradigms for a new world we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true, looking for those new ways of living here on the program. And we certainly hope that uh, you enjoy these programs as well as we talk with Reverend Paul Nugent about the Aetherius Society. Aetherius.org, that's the website. We will be linked to that website as well, both on uh, the uh, website richarddugan.com as well as through the podcast link that is create that I create when I upload the podcast to SoundCloud. I want to dovetail continue. I want to continue to uh, talk about this because I find it fascinating. Uh, there was a gentleman who wrote a book called AD and it has to do with the same subject uh, having to do with after disclosure. That was uh, the acronym AD. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he was sharing with me how um, you know, once once the government says that, yeah, yeah, they're aliens, we're not alone, da, 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 uh, that everything will change, our whole economy, our religious institutions, our educational institutions, the list goes on. Well, my very first question to him was, um, and this was more just in a, a, just a conversation, it wasn't an interview at this point, my first question to him would be, what makes you think that the public's going to believe the government since the government's been lying to the public for decades about the existence of other beings out there. 
Then the other aspect of it, too, that you kind of alluded to uh, has to do with the technology. If these beings, the gods of space, as, it's re as, as Dr. King refers to, uh, can travel intergalactically, if that is the case, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now if they were here to take over. All right. This out if they were our enemies. And by the way, that's another area that we'll talk about too, because, okay, now the government is saying, yeah, we're not alone in the universe, but they're turning them into our enemy. It's, it's like the human being, for some reason, and the powers that be cannot get along for any period of time without having an enemy. It's just bizarre. Mm. Well, actually, this was this was foretold by um, uh, von Ver Werner, I think. Um, I Werner von Braun? Ver Ver that's Werner Ver Ver von Braun. I knew I had part of that. Right. Yeah, apparently, I, I met um, someone who worked for him um, or, and was with him close to his death. And this was his great concern that we would turn extraterrestrials into the enemy which uh, is silly and pointless because um you know uh, it's obvious that they have far greater uh, um, ability in that regard but they're not here for that <laughs> and, and you know just coming back very briefly to crop circles <laughs> these things are incredibly beautiful they're incredibly inspiring mm -hmm. i think that these you know th these cosmic intelligences unlike us are not stupid uh, and i think that they know that if they were to be too blatant uh, in their appearance, then it would tr trigger uh, absolute mayhem, anarchy, riots, etc. Uh, and what goes with that, of course, is more shootings uh, and, and lootings and chaos and um, a complete sort of breakdown of law and order and society. They're not here for that. They're here to inspire us. They're here to slowly awake us. I like it. the gun to liken it a little bit, uh, pardon the frog, but a little bit like, you know, boiling the frog. You do it slowly so that the frog can adjust. And I think that, um, you know, likewise, again, these crop circles, they, they, they should, um, once we've got through the sort of uh, the fear and the, the fakeness and, uh, and the stupidity that, you know, goes around it, but they should begin to, they should inspire us, they should cause us to start asking these bigger, deeper questions. And I think in the, in the months and in, in forthcoming years, we will certainly begin to do that because as the problems mount and as it becomes in, increasingly clear that politicians simply do not have the answers. They, I mean, they create perhaps more problems than they solve, <laughs> uh, but it is, it's, it's no longer the sort of go-to solution. Yeah. Uh, politics is not the answer, never has been in point of fact, and probably never will be. Uh, it's our own coming back to our own conscience. It's coming back to our own awakening of ourselves. Um, that our own inspiration, our own intuition, uh, that is going to be the real sort of planetary game changer. Mm. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation that uh, I, I love having, and I'm glad that you're with us here, Reverend Paul Nugent of the Aetherius Society, one of the directors of the U.S. Uh, uh, version or the U.S. branch, if you will, of the Aetherius Society, aetheriussociety.org. AtheriusSociety.org is the website, and we hope that you will go to that website. We are linked to it as well, and uh, continue your evolutionary process as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. We are bringing, uh, bringing you choices and knowledge of those choices, and one of those choices I want to talk about now uh, has to do with, and I mean, there are nine of them specifically, uh, we've, we've sort of talked about God and the meaning of life, although we didn't quite get into the meaning of life, but before we go there, I want to talk about the Mother Earth and our future, which we've sort of alluded to a little bit. There are those who say we've already uh, gone beyond the tipping point, the point of no return when it comes to um, what we have done to the planet in terms of whether you want to call it climate change. Some people say global warming. Some say it's, hey, this is just the natural cycle of the planet um, and so on and so on and so on. And I say, you know what? Throw all of that stuff out, okay? Just throw it all out. I don't even want to talk about any of that stuff. 
What I want to talk about is this. Don't you think we should clean up our home, period? Even if there is climate change, even if the planet is warming up, even if the oceans are rising, don't you think we should clean our home? Talk to us about your, uh, the Aetherius Society's perspective on Mother Earth and uh, because some have said that Mother Earth is a living, breathing, shall we say, being that we are living on and um, that she won't die, that she will do what is necessary for her own self-preservation, whatever that might mean. Yeah, again, Richard, another sort of major topic, although I'm all with you just on the literal sense of cleaning up one's own home. I mean, why, why you know, walking around Hollywood, I mean, there's so much trash, why? You know, there is no need to, to drop trash. But again, it sort of comes back to this sort of, not so much consciousness, but rather lack of consciousness uh, and a lack of um, a sort of a wholesome way of life. But in terms of, well, if, coming back to the Second World War uh, and, and the Battle of Britain, but at the end of the Battle of Britain, um, Winston Churchill, he said, this is not the end nor is it the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. And the reason I, I quote that is because I, I, I like to sort of apply that to the whole sense of coming back to also cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, co cosmic consciousness is not the end, nor is it the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. And we haven't yet begun. We don't begin truly until we have this state of, of cosmic consciousness coming back to purpose of life. I think to attain cosmic consciousness is the purpose of life. Um, and in that state, as we were discussing earlier on, one realizes that everything is living, everything is interconnected, which includes the mother earth, which includes all the planets, which includes the entire solar system, even the in galaxy is a living being. The whole of creation is alive and interconnected and one organic whole uh, with this unknown intelligence or being, whatever it may be, God having brought about its manifestation, which is, you know, we, didn't, we did not discuss God, that's quite true. But so we recognize fully in the Aetherius Society that this earth is totally a highly evolved conscious intelligence um, one can't see consciousness, but it nonetheless, one can sense it. It exists. It exists within, within the Mother Earth. And um, to cut a very long story uh, short, but our understanding from these beings from space uh, is that the, the whole vibration of the Mother Earth is being quickened. Uh, following an, uh, an initiation, a cosmic initiation, a tremendous infusion of energy, which she received in 1964. And as a consequence of that, everything on the planet, as I say, is, is being quickened. It's being slowly quickened, again, a little bit like the analogy of boiling the frog. Uh, it's not turn the heat right up immediately. But, and I think that we, you know, you can sense that in every way, in, in, in every aspect of life. Things are being quickened. There is a pressure on, on humanity to change. And uh, it, in a way, uh, well, not only does it go back to the Mother Earth's vibrations being quickened, but the whole of creation's vibrations are being quickened. Um, well, I, I don't know how much longer time we have, but you know, sometimes when people ask people, hey, Paul, what's going on? I like to sort of somewhat uh, tongue in cheek, or well, not tongue in cheek, but, but, but reply, Lani Achaia. And they look at me with a blank stare and they say, What's Lani Achaia? Lani Achaia is a supercluster of galaxies. It's actually a beautiful Hawaiian word, which means immeasurable heaven. What's really going on is that everything in our galaxy, and our galaxy, along with hundreds of thousands of other galaxies, are moving at phenomenal speed towards this super cluster of galaxies known as Lanier Care. That's what's really going on. And so everything is in this process of, 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 of evolution, of unfolding, of growing into greater and greater and greater levels of consciousness and realization. It's just a, a most unbelievable, unimaginable, magnificent thing that we're all a part of. 
and um, the, the Mother Earth is very much tied into that, uh, as is our whole solar system. Uh, and so are we, so are we. We're also an integral part of that. Well, I tell you, I, uh, I'm, I'm impressed with what you've had to say. I, uh, I've only been here, as I said, a scant 61 years. Uh, our existence is less than a puff of smoke in the, in the grand scheme of things. And um, yet at the same time, there's another area that I want to talk with you about as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. New paradigms for a new world, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. This is a program that is designed with you in mind to help you to move forward in your life, to transform your life, to continue your, and I'm going to use the word because I think it's appropriate, your evolutionary process. I think that that's what we are we are about right now is we're evolving i even i even challenge people who don't like to use that word because well, you know because of their particular philosophy and i say well then why do you send your kids to school you want them to move forward to evolve to transform to learn more to be more uh you know i remember being told to go to the library and read a book and and expand your horizons that kind of thing uh and so forth so we we are we are doing just that we are growing and changing i mean that's the whole point it's one of the points if you will of this existence is to grow is to evolve if you will and i want to talk to you about that especially in light of the concept of service but i want to tie that into reincarnation because <clears throat> i went through a program uh, uh or i should say i went through an experience uh, called LBL, Life Between Lives. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or not, but it has to do with a, um, a hypnosis process. And you are conscious. I was completely aware of everything that was happening, both in the room I was in as well as the process I was going through. And the process took me back to my last life before this one, right up to my death, and then into the next experience, the next life, which is this one. And it was that space between the two lives that I experienced some very incredible things. Now, I wasn't led by the hand. I was only, the questions I was asked were, what do you see, what do you hear, what are you experiencing? And I have to provide the information. And it was extraordinary, very extraordinary. But I carry with me a book that was given to me 40 years ago by my dear friend who passed away a few years ago. And we would have conversations, kind of like what you and I are having right now. And it's called The Impersonal Life. And it was written by a gentleman by the name of James Banner in the 19-teens, I think 1916. And I carry it with me. I actually had to have it rebound because the binding was breaking up. But it talked about reincarnation also, and the book is kind of uh, geared toward, uh, it's like God talking to you. And it says along the lines of this, you say that when you go into uh, a past life regression, that you are tapping into the lives that you've lived in the past. But I tell you that you are tapping into my manifestation of other lives that I have created over the years. And I thought, well, how does that change the reason why I would go back and take a look at those lives? It doesn't because we're, we go back to take a look at those things to learn something. One of the aspects of our lives is service. Uh, I, I often ask the question of my guests, what's your life's purpose? Mine is to be of service, to do what I can. Now, I got to take care of me too. I got to keep my health going well and I feel pretty good right now. Um, but let's talk about this aspect of service uh, and, and carrying it forward uh, in terms of, because it seems to me like that's what you're doing. You are being of service through the Aetherius Society to help people to raise their consciousness, help them to achieve Kundalini or uh, a Samadhi or cosmic consciousness, to help the species to evolve, to move forward into a new era where we're here for, we're here for ourselves and for each other. Can you can you talk to us about that? I know that's big. I know that's huge. Can you talk? All, all, all your questions are big, Richard, but that, so they should be. Um, well, um, certainly, 
the, in, in the Ethereum society, we fully recognize uh, re reincarnation. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't have you can't have reincarnation without karma, and you can't have karma without reincarnation. I mean, the two literally go hand in hand. I mean, so we create our next life by all that we think, do, feel, etc. In, in this present life. We're manipulating our karma all, all, all of the time. And that very much does, you know, in itself tie into, into service. Um, it's, it's the driving force of the Ethereum society. Um, I would say both in terms of um, uh, putting out what we would call the right, the true message, well, the true message. I mean, you know, obviously one doesn't want to get too sort of trapped into dogma or anything like that. Yeah. But, you know, we, we, certainly sh we, we certainly share our, our beliefs and our understanding. And our beliefs and understanding are not selfish by their nature. It's not, you know, um, how can I make more money, get rich quick, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's entirely about how can I, um, become more awake, um, you know, attain a greater sort of realization of, of what life's purpose is, is really all about. So there is the sort of, and making people aware of, of not just the things like karma and reincarnation, but also, of course, beings on other worlds. I mean, it's not part of ordinary uh, terrestrial culture, at least at this time. Uh, but the other thing we do is certainly, I mean, <laughs> Is, is service because it's not just the right information it's the right energy it's a healing energy or if you if you really want to boil it down it's about love it's about radiating love and that's something which we do in the ethereal society particularly through prayer prayer is um as wonderfully described by the great mahatma gandhi uh, prayer properly understood and applied uh is the most um powerful what is prayer properly understood and applied um is the most powerful form of action what those weren't quite his words i've temporarily forgotten what he actually said but it, it's a way of invoking energy conditioning it with one's love and radiating it out uh to another individual through a, a spiritual healing one or to the world as a whole it's imbuing the world with this love energy and that's something which we do in the Ethereum society uh, um, in, in various uh, different ways. We, uh, for example, we have the, following the earthquake, um, tragic major earthquake in Haiti just over a week ago. Uh, we already had pre-collected uh, hundreds of hours of prayer energy, which we were able, in cooperation with the gods from space, be able to immediately send to the situation in Haiti, bringing uh, uh, help in all of the relief efforts, uh, help for anybody who'd lost a loved one with the grief, whatever. It's a love energy and it's an incredibly um, tangible, real force that we're all capable of invoking. That's what actually our world needs is, is more spiritual energy. Um, and we do it all the time in the Ethereum Society, in, in, in all our services. We just went uh, this past Saturday uh, to a mountain, we believe, that was charged by cosmic intelligences with a heightened um, source of this spiritual energy. Uh, we go there um, to tap into this energy and again through prayer, through mantra, uh, radiate it out to the world. So, these are some of the ways in, in which we are of service in the Ethereum society. I've often heard it said that prayer is the glue that, in a manner of speaking, and this is around the world, the various forms of prayer, that is holding, <laughs> that's holding our civilization together. And that if all of the various uh, groups of people that are out there praying, whether it's the Tibetans or the Muslims or whatever group, the Catholics saying the rosary, whatever, uh, if they all stopped, everything would fall apart. I think that's very likely, actually. Yeah. <laughs> aye, yeah, yeah. Keep uh, praying, please. Uh, uh, please, uh, folks, please keep praying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well it, I mean, you know, I, in prayer, I love to, I love to um, 
be, um, actually quote Hamlet, believe it or not, um, because, you know, there's a very sort of common phrase, I'll pray for you, you're, you're in our prayers, but it's very surface, it's very super, or it can be very superficial. Um, and and, and uh, uh, prayer properly understood and applied is the most potent instrument of action, to come back to that quote from Gandhi. But what Shakespeare, what Hamlet had to say, I don't know how, and I'll make this quote, brief as well but you're fine. You know, ha 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 Hamlet wanted revenge on his uncle Claudius who he believed rightly so had killed his own father that's the whole you know purpose of the play yeah uh, and Hamlet's attempts to sort of take revenge on his uncle Claudius and he and he has this opportunity he's, he's behind a, a, a drape with, with, with his dagger and he his Claudius is right there he can come out and stab him now kill him get his revenge but it, but ha Claudius is on his knees and it looks as though Claudius is praying and Hamlet thinks to himself oh no no if I kill him now when he's praying I'm going to send him to heaven and I don't want to do that uh, and so Hamlet withdraws, but then Claudius gets up and he says these lines. He says, my words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. And so I say that again, you know, prayer properly understood and applied. It has to have feeling. You have to put heart into it. You have to mean it. And it has to be unselfish. Uh, and, 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 you know, you are reaching out, you are reaching out to a higher source uh, and, and with conviction, with belief and conditioning it with your love. And when you do that in that way, yes, then that is what is holding our world together. And if we all did it, we would transform our world. Absolutely. I know Greg Braden, a guest we've had on this program many times, used to use a mathematical equation. Uh, or, or number, I should say, that if there were, if there was just, um, I, I forget what the exact exact percentage was, but it was extremely small. I mean, there are 8 billion people on the planet, nearly 8 billion. And I seem to recall that the number of people, if the number of people's intentions were focused and the number was somewhere, I'm just throwing this out there, in somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000, that's, that's minuscule. Mm. to the total population. But if there were only 200,000 people on the planet, mm. focus their intentions on one thing, mm. boom, transformation, transformation. It doesn't take much. I think it's best, uh, I, I would have to say that's probably best summarized by the passage from the New Testament that says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there mm. I am in the midst. That's right, yeah, yeah. Great power. In, in prayer, great power. And by the way, I would also take it to the next level as far as uh, being myself a Reiki master. And the, the, the teaching that I was given was that uh, Reiki, in this case, for the purposes of uh, sending energy to either someone or a situation, which I mm. found so fascinating. Oh, you mean like I could send Reiki energy to my my bank account, you know, to, I don't know, help me a little. Well, I've even heard stories of people who will do Reiki on their car as they're driving because the gas gauge is at E and they're trying to get to a gas station and they actually make it. Yeah, no, I can actually go along with that pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, you do not control how the energy is used. Let's say if you, as I did that with, with, uh, with my, my father's uh, brother who died of cancer, uh, sent him absentee healing. Uh, gave him the energy and the strength to throw his medication across the room, get in his wheelchair, go across the compound where his son lived in another house. They had a, a time of closure. I don't know if it was a, an hour or more or whatever it was. And then he passed. All right. Well, guess what? My uncle was healed by virtue of the fact that he was able to do the things that he wanted to do and then leave the afflicted physical body that he was occupying mm -hmm. to me that 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 you know and of course i've i've often asked many people uh, uh reverend that i said who are into uh, health and wellness and you know prepare you know a positive uh, uh um uh, shall we say preventative medicine so to speak what is healing in your perspective what is it what is healing really so I'm asking you that question because that's also one of the subjects of the nine is what about healing? What what is it really from the Aetherius uh, perspective? Mm, that's another, another good question. Richard. Um, 
you know, the very uh, the simplest answer I would give is is healing is love. It's love. Um, we live in a, we live in a universe of love, or that that's the name we give to the frequency of energy of which this universe is made up, and it's it's reaching out to that energy. We can all feel it, you know, in our heart chakra, uh, and it's a very it's it's a very tangible energy that we can also when we feel it, when we invoke it, when we feel it, when we channel it, uh, we can channel it into another person through the, their psychic centers because chakras are these aspects of the body through which energy flows in and out. They're also in the mother earth, mother earth has chakras. Uh, it's one way we actually in the ethereal study, uh, you, you could say we give healing to the mother earth, not that she necessarily needs it, but we, it's, it's, it's done as a token repayment for that she's given to, to us to be here, mm -hmm. uh, to go through this, you know, evolutionary karmic experience. Um, so really it's, I would say it's the invocation of love. And I think that you know, I think a lot of people, this is, you know, in terms of psychosomatic, I mean, you know, the way coming back to how, how we talk to ourselves, um, we induce negative conditions uh, which manifest in, in, in ill health in our own body and mental illness, particularly. Uh, so how we, how we talk to ourselves is also very important. Um, you know, do we talk to ourselves in a loving way? In a, in a sort of understanding uh, way, or do we you know, spend the whole time beating ourselves up? Because if we do, it's gonna put us into a very negative spiral and, and bring about the disease. So it's, it, it's fundamentally is, is the, the manifestation and the manipulation of this energy called love. That I would say is a simple way of describing the process of healing. And I have to wonder, too, if maybe healing is the wrong word. Maybe we need to, to choose a different word. Uh, I've heard some people want to maybe change it to uh, uh, becoming balanced or, as you, you know, you use the word love. That's, that's a beautiful thing. And I think that we need to consider those possibilities. As we continue here with Reverend Paul Nugent, he is uh, one of the directors of the American of, uh, uh, outlet of the Aetherius Society, Aetherius.org. Aetherius.org is the website as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true, looking for those new ways of living with the new paradigms for a new world here on the program with uh, my very special guest, Reverend, uh, Reverend Paul Nugent. Uh, and uh, of course, you're coming to us uh, uh, via Zoom all the way, all the way from, well, in this case, uh, it's uh, Hollywood, California or Los Angeles, uh, not across the pond, but be that as it may, and you've been here for over 30 years. Uh, I'm curious before we wrap this up, and I know we're going to we're going to have to do so here shortly. What has been your? Uh, let me back that question up. How did you first become uh, aware of the Aetherius Society? And uh, if I may ask a, a, a part B, and what was it? that intrigued you so that you now find yourself as one of the directors? Yeah, uh, great question, um, Richard. You know, as a young man in England, um, coming back to this thing of conscience, I, I, I was just very aware that um, life was, there was more to life than just, you know, having a job, having a career, having, getting a mortgage, uh, getting married, having kids settling down all the rest of it you know something intuitively inside myself said no Paul, Paul that there's got to be more than this and I didn't know what it was I didn't know what to do but I turned um having been raised in the uh, in, you know England's a Christian country I read for the first time with any seriousness the four gospels of the New Testament Matthew Mark Luke and John and it had a very profound effect on me it was a changing point in my life because I recognized that here was someone named Jesus Christ who did understand how we should be living on earth. And uh, so I became very active um, in, in the Christian church in London at the time. But by a curious, I went, curious set of circumstances, but karma is karma. And, 
you know, karma will have its way. Um, I was working, I was working for a company in London, in the wine trade, actually, and my boss was studying Eastern philosophy, mm. very interesting man, um, to whom he remains a friend to this day. And uh, so I, out of that, started studying Eastern philosophy as well at a school in London. Um, the Bhagavad Gita was, was the main text. And things like karma and reincarnation made sense to me beyond just this sort of, you know, biblical or Christian teaching. And his secretary was a, a member who, who joined us again in a fairly unusual circumstances, but she was a member of the Aetherius Society. And so through her, I was introduced to this organization. Uh, she'd also been to a place in Scotland you might have heard of called Findhorn, where they grew this incredible garden by coming back to being sight, using psychic abilities, communicating with the devic elements of, of, of um, particular plants. They grew a phenomenal garden. Um, this was back in the 50s, Kintorn still exists to this day. I went there in the 80s and th that was a very um, you know, transformative experience for me as well. But I intuitively sensed that it was going to be a theorist society where I would wind up. And in 1958, um, coming back to Dr. George King and these transmissions he received. Uh, on 12 Sundays in 1958, which was the year I was born, probably one or two years before you, um, he received, we believe in the Ethereum Society, 12 transmissions from the Master Jesus. Uh, we, it's known as the 12 Blessings. It's like a cosmic extension to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And as I listened to these blessings and, and more particularly um, joined in, in radiating coming back to prayer, because there are, it's also a way of sending out spiritual energy through prayer, it was an incredibly tangible experience. I remember it felt like shafts of white light going out through the palms of my hands. Now, this is Jesus in 1958. I'd read the four Gospels. This is how I came into it. But it, it was such a a powerful experience and the truth that was being spoken in these 12 blessings was just literally something that I couldn't ignore. I knew it was something that I had to, to, take, to take further. And so I investigated more about the theory study. I'd never really considered UFOs at all, but it opened me up to that whole new reality. And so that is, you know, my own sort of origins of coming into the Ethereum society and, um, you know, why, I, why I've stayed. I want to ask you also about uh, Dr. George King. Uh, who is he to those who are, and I guess the best way I can put it right now, uh, because of my limited understanding of the Aetherius Society, other than what you've shared with me and what I've read, uh, who is he to those who are members of the Aetherius Society? Is is he a master like Jesus? Is he a messenger of God? Is he a prophet? Is he a visionary, etc., etc.? What, what, what category, if, if he even falls into a category, would we say that he is uh, a part of? Yeah, well, certainly he was a, he was a, a, um, a yoga master in his own right. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, he trained himself with incredible discipline and intensity, practicing yoga for eight hours a day over a 10 year period, in addition to holding down a full-time job and everything else. But that was his goal. Uh, and so uh, just without question, he, 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 was, a, he was a master. Uh, he, he taught absolute truth. He, he had a complete um, total grasp of, anything and everything to do with metaphysics. Uh, he was able to project from his body. He was able to go into positive yogic somatic trance to, to be able to telepathically connect with these intelligences upon the other worlds uh, and allow them to speak through him. Uh, and these were recorded over 600 transmissions came through Dr. George King in this way. So he was an uh, unquestionably, um, a yoga, uh, a yoga master. But we actually also believe in the Aetherius Society. He never revealed it during his own lifetime, but he was, he was more than that. We actually do believe that he was an avatar, uh, an avatar being a, a, a being who originated from another world in our, in, in our own solar system. 
um, you know, people who sort of like to brag about these things, the true ones don't. The, the true ones, they don't reveal it at all. Um, I think it's quite possible that those who were around the Master Jesus um, knew that he was from another world. Uh, you know, I am from the bright and morning star, which of course is Venus. Um, but it's, 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 you see, it's very difficult for us humans to grasp this at our present level of, 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 of understanding. Mm. But yeah, we do actually also believe that Dr. George King um, was what we call an adept um, from another world. I mean, and, and the more one studies his life, and we've got a wonderful biography, came out a couple of years ago, uh, it literally titled The King Who Came to Earth. Uh, that I very much recommend to your, to your listeners. Um, and, you, you know, as I say, the more one does study his life uh, and all that he did, which was just incredible, uh, I think one will come to that realisation that he was indeed. But it's not something that he, you know, openly spoke about at all. Uh, and and I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna dive a little further into this because I'm I'm very curious. I have not really found one individual um, who I have felt the need to follow, uh, to share with other people. Oh, you, you this this person has male or female. This person has you know the answers. I mean, I've had people on from the happy science, I've had Scientologists on, atheists, Christians, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, the list goes on, and, and yet I'm more interested in the message. Is, and, and I guess that's really where I want to I wanna direct this question, uh, Reverend. Which, uh, which is more important, if, if it's possible to compartmentalize this? the messages, the transmissions that Dr. George King brought, or George King? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, you know, coming back to, you know, my own experience, which is probably the only thing I can really speak about, um, of coming into this, uh, it wasn't, you know, George King to me was an unknown. But um, the 12 blessings was something that I could read, that I could listen to because they were recorded. We play one of them in, in each of our uh, Sunday services we, uh, as it was delivered by the Master Jesus. So it's something I could listen to. And in the prayers, it was something that I could practice. And it was that experience and that sort of appreciation of what was being said, uh, how profound it was, how, ne how urgent it was, how necessary to the whole philosophical and spiritual understanding of humanity it was. And as I say, through the, pr the practice of the prayers, these things led me to, to sort of be more curious in who is George King. But uh, it wasn't, oh, yeah, he looks like a great guy. I'm going to follow what he says. I don't think you can do it that way. You have to, you know, it's what, it's what it is the, the, the message that he brought through, the missions, the, the, the spiritual work I mentioned invoking spiritual energy and sending it out to the world in, in Haiti and various, many, many other situations. We've been doing this for, over, um, for nearly 50 years, point mm -hmm. of fact, invoking energy, sending it out to all kinds of situations. Um, so it's engaging in, it's studying the work. It's engaging in the work. It's doing the spiritual practices, uh, all, all of which I think, believe, certainly did for myself, will lead one to an appreciation of Dr. George King. In other words, um, the cart before the horse. Right, right. And I think that uh, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, of which I was a member for about a year and a half back in the early 90s, uh, said, if you accept, if you reject one of the messengers of God, you reject them all. And if you accept one of the messengers of God, you accept them all. And you consider Dr. George King to be a messenger of God? I'd have to say yes. Yeah, I'd have to say yes. Uh, of course. Yeah. And, you know, and, and from what I have heard and what I have read thus far, by the way, the, one of the reasons, folks, why I pursued this interview is because, and I forget who introduced me to the 12 blessings. Wajit Hassan. Yes. Uh, Hassan, that's right, that's right. Uh, and we had a great conversation, and he sent me the, 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 the link to the website to the, to the 12 Blessings, and I read them, and I'm going, wow. You also have the nine freedoms. 
the You're night. absolutely right. Yeah. And I'm gonna, very quickly, folks, before we wrap things up here, I'm going to go through them very quickly. I'm not going to go through description. You need to go to the website, the uh, Aetherius Society, and that's the Aetheri uh, that's Aetherius.org, Aetherius.org. They are bravery, love, service, enlightenment, cosmic consciousness, ascension, interplanetary existence, and I think this is pronounced Saturnian existence and solar existence. But bear in mind, this is not the end. All you have to do is go to the website, and that is Aetherius.org to find out more as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. This is Tell Me Your Story, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We're here with Reverend Paul Nugent. And uh, Reverend, uh, before we let you go, I have three final questions that I would like to ask you that I ask all of my guests. Uh, some people uh, often uh, are, are a bit in awe of the questions only because they say, wow, you, you leave the easy questions for the end. I try. I try. But before I ask you those questions, I want to thank you for giving us so much time. And I'm hoping we can have you back because there is, uh, if, if you go to the website, folks, it's just full. There is so much to, to take in. And I like to say, I like to use the word, Reverend, I like to use the word to grok, as it says in Stranger in a Strange Land. To, and I define that as assimilating it into every subatomic particle of your being. If it resonates with you, don't do it if it doesn't resonate with you. But if it does, take it in and consider it. Ponder it. Kind of like Mary did with Jesus and the things he was doing. Ponder it. I love that word. Uh, but I thank you so much for uh, sharing with us today. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Richard. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, I'm glad you didn't turn those cannons on me. <laughs> uh, they're, just, they're just for show. They're made of plastic. Anyway. Before I ask you those three questions, I need to remind you, the listener and the viewer, that this is Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are here Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., Wednesdays at 9 a.m. with a special edition of Tell Me Your Story. The podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. We're also on YouTube where you can watch these videos. You can watch the interviews and see us interacting, and I think that can be kind of fun, too. Uh, but also listen to the interview. I uh, hope you subscribe i really do uh 45 000 listens of, through the soundcloud analytics over three over three just over three and a half years as a matter of fact reverend this program celebrates the end of our 14th year going into our 15th year of broadcasting podcasting of this program tell me your story we started september the 7th of 2007 with program number one and i don't even know how many programs i've done but it's so exciting your program your this interview this conversation inaugurates the beginning of our 15th year of tell me your story and i'm glad that we have done just that inaugurated this uh, this particular time with our conversation here i also uh, need to finish by saying that if you'd like to support the work we're doing folks we'll take whatever you can uh, share with us through paypal for your security as well as ours just use richard at richarddugan.com as the email address to send whatever you can and then participate in the decade of perfect vision the 2020s go within spend that time listening to that still small voice and just you know what the way to be perfect is just to be just be in that space you don't have to do anything you don't have to say anything you don't have to think anything just be for five take five minutes five whole enormous minutes and just be in that still small space and with that we now jump into the final segment of our program and that is the three final questions that i like to ask my guests and the first of those three is who is paul nugent mm. and they say that's one of the easy questions that's the most difficult <laughs> question of all um 
I'm a, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, my own complex manifestation of the same life force that animates you and animates everybody else and everything else. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you are doing now? I'd like to see the egg timer be turned around. In other words, the collective thinking of humanity to be turned on its head and for a whole new vision and realization and understanding to take genuine, true, lasting root as we head into a new world, a new, a new age. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Uh, to understand more about my own innate divinity or aspect of being this life force that is in everything and everyone. Uh, and to help turn the egg timer upside down. Hmm. Reverend Paul Nugent, I want to thank you again for joining us here on the program from the Aetherius Society, uh, one of the directors of uh, the Aetherius Society, American chapter, and uh, it's been a great pleasure, and I definitely would like to have you back uh, in the not-too-distant future to continue our conversation on just a myriad of other uh, subjects that we could talk about, including uh, maybe going through the 12 bl 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 the 12 <laughs> blessings i'm hoping one of them is uh, a fluent speech uh, but uh, nonetheless thank you again for joining us uh, richard it's been an absolute pleasure and i mean that very sincerely and also i did not know but you know very sincere congratulations to you on on you know making 15 years that's uh, no easy accomplishment so it all comes down to your skill and ability your commitment and your own passion so thank you well, thank you very much. And I will tell you, I, it's hard to believe that it's been uh, that we're going into our 15th year. I just it's like, really? <laughs> and then I go, oh, that's right. I'm 61. Yeah, that's possible. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And again, I thank you for joining us. And I thank you for listening and watching. Tell me your story. New paradigms for a new world. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, Love to Love.